my name's Ian and welcome to my channel. Uh, first, a disclosure. Lucid Eye Publications approached me to take a look at this game, Elf King, and provided a PDF copy of the core rulebook for me to review. No money changed hands and the agreement I made with them is that, as with all of my reviews, I'd highlight both what I felt was good and bad about it. So this isn't a paid promotion and is my honest thoughts on the game. Now, having read through the rulebook and given the rules themselves a tryout, the following is my review and overview of Elf King, the immortal role-playing game, revised edition by Lucid Eye Publications, released earlier this year, that year being 2023 at the time of recording. So, let's get into it. The core concept of Elf King is that the characters play immortal elves, the Fae, who are the primary movers and shakers of the spiral island realm of Eas. It is postulated within the core rulebook that an eternal civil war amongst the Fae has allowed forces from outside Eas to raid into the lands of the elves, for various purposes that the mighty among the Fae would combat, along with vying with each other. The suggested default beginnings is that the player characters are companions, a troop that is allied to one another and acts together, under the command of a non-player character, Thane. This allows the Game Master an avatar within the setting, through which missions can be communicated. As the game progresses and the characters grow in fame, glare within the concept of the rules, they may rise to become thanes in their own right and leave their own troops against trollkind, mortals, the forces of hell and other thanes. The system is pretty simple. Characters have six virtues, which, in a similar vein to the storyteller system of Vampire the Masquerade, determine how many ten-sided dice are rolled to perform a given action. The virtues are might, describing physical prowess, finesse, which roughly equates to agility and dexterity, reason, equating to intelligence, will, which is fortitude of mind, essence, reflecting a character's attachment to life and magic, roughly equivalent to RuneQuest's power, and elan, basically charisma. Beyond these six virtues, characters possess skills, which, in this game, are innate capabilities which have values derived from one or more virtues, usually averaged, and laws, which are learned capabilities and can be increased through experience. Not that there is a specific experience system for the game. This is more a narrative form of character improvement refereed by the Game Master than a mechanistic system baked into the rules. The basic mechanic involves picking which virtue, skill, law or other statistic, there are a few additional derived statistics such as magical defence and focus, and rolling that number of ten-sided dice. Every seven rolled is a success, every ten rolled is a critical success. Here it departs from the storyteller form, instead of having a set number of successes to achieve with a success threshold based on difficulty, Elf King instead provides a consistent roll versus roll contest. When skills collide, both parties roll their d10s and compare the results. Criticals cancel out criticals, successes cancel out successes, and whichever side has the most successes and criticals left at the end wins the contest. For rolls that are not made against other statistics, difficulties are represented by the number of d10s rolled in opposition to the statistic activity being used. Average is 8 dice, and increasing difficulty levels add more dice to the pool, while decreasing easier tasks subtract dice. Also unlike Storyteller, there is no concept of a botch or a fumble negating successes. I find this suitably correct for a game focused on heroic immortals. Combat uses this core system, adding complexity to weapon use by assigning minimum and optimal might and finesse virtue scores in each weapon. Under the minimum, a penalty is accrued to the eventual attack dice, over the optimal, and a bonus is received. Similarly, armour types have such minimum and optimal ratings, with the bonuses or penalties applying to their defence. Each weapon has a base attack dice, each armour type has a base defence dice, and these are rolled against one another, with the bonuses and penalties accrued as mentioned. 
Successes on the attacking dice remaining are subtracted from the defending character's lifebird pool, basically hit points, and one of those derived statistics that I mentioned earlier. And then the rolls are reversed and resolved. Reaching zero lifeblood indicates death. No negative lifeblood or death saves here. The game and setting encourage the aspect of quarter, accepting defeat and conceding the win to your opponent without dying. So while lethal in nature, the broader system does provide for a get-out-of-jail-free card. Or not so free, but alive. And now we come to magic. There are two forms of magic within Elf King. Rud magic, or rude magic, and glamers. Rude magic is raw magic used in combat, and is used by attacking using will against the target's magical defence. Every success that comes up on the attack roll expends one glamer point. The magic points that are used to cast both rude and glamer, whether the attack gets through or not. Successes that do get through inflict one lifeblood against the target each. Simple enough, and is the equivalent of the various bolt and missile spells in other games. The only mystery here for me is that it explicitly noted that missile weapons are viewed as dishonourable, but it is seemingly fine to blast your foes at range with bolts of magic. It is perhaps not dishonourable to wield magic in this way, but it does seem counterintuitive to me where the very reason missiles were seen by, in some cultures, as dishonourable was because melee combat was viewed as intrinsically honourable. Anyway, uh, glamers are effectively spells in a more traditional sense. They are each named, with costs in glamour points, with a given effect. Where tests on the part of the caster are indicated, they follow similar form to weapons, minimum and optimal values of essence and so on. Glamers are also subdivided into categories. Fey glamers used by elves, Trollkin secrets used by Trollkin, and Pell hexes used by Pell witches. These three types reflect the nature of the primary users of them. There are also spells with temporary effects, which consume glamour points, which can easily be replenished, and those with permanent effects, usually in the form of rituals, which require permanent investiture of essence. Characters are limited to the number of glamours that they can hold in memory at any given time, as dictated by their reason virtue, which makes the use of them feel somewhat vancian. Indeed, the process of learning new spells, transcribing them into a character's own spellbook, and using that spellbook to memorise a spell for later casting all sits within the shadow of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons' earliest editions, particularly its first. I don't say this is a bad thing, it's just that in reading, and in what play we have had, that involved this aspect, it brought back those memories. Anyway, to give you an illustration of a fey glamour, I bring to you, for your consideration, Tristesse. With this glamour, the caster can reduce a target's reason and will temporarily, potentially reducing their own magical ability, reduction of reason reduces capacity to hold glamours in memory, and the ability to resist further magics. Magic defence is based on will, and so reduction of will leaves a being more susceptible to magical effects. All for the cost of between 1 to 5 glamour points. This latter is rolled randomly, so the spell could be attempted if a character only possessed, say, three points, but would automatically fail if a cost of four or five was rolled in that instance. Trollkin's secrets tend to be more visceral than fey glamours, with such wonders as flay scale, which inflicts one to ten lifeblood points in the form of painful ripping of skin from flesh and shatter spine, which slays an a injured victim by, as the name suggests, shattering their spine. Pell hexes resemble voodoo witchcraft somewhat, with many hexes being used in conjunction with an effigy of a target, a grey malkin. Using such a malkin, a pell witch can inflict a target with poxes and other afflictions. And that, dear viewer, is a potted summary of the system itself. As for play, a run-through of the example scenario in the core rulebook of Mortal Flesh provides a fleeting introduction that I feel misses much of the build-up of the game's thematic context. 
Avoiding too many spoilers, the scenario is in the form of a supposedly simple mission given to the player's fae by the Thane to drive back a mortal incursion that then progresses effectively into a monster hunt. The scenario is five pages long and is therefore limited by space as to the scope that it can achieve, but while it does leave plenty of hooks for a games master to add his own continuation, it does not explore some of the aspects of the game that would be more alien to players familiar with role-playing and potentially even harder to grasp for newcomers to the hobby. However, as a simple introduction to the basic mechanics of the game, it works. I love games that bring something new to the table, and Elf King does do that. It has a broad scope. While the game itself is inspired by Earl Koenig by Von Goeth, it is, for me, more reminiscent of Moorcock's Melnibone at its height, uh, or the underground realms of, uh, of the Fae uh, that are depicted in Irish mythology and within Paul Anderson's uh, Three Hearts and Three Lions. In any case, the concept of the immortal Fae Thanes battling each other in various forces external to their realms is an interesting one. The system itself is built on a simple test versus test basis, which is elegant enough. I think when you are describing high concepts in gaming, it is always better to avoid being too crunchy and mechanical with the rules. Otherwise, the risk becomes that the players spend more time focusing on the rules than the concept, which is a mistake often seen within RPGs. Where Elf King is concerned, although it does come close to the wind in its combat rules, it nevertheless strikes a fair balance between mechanical crunch and artistic concept. I couldn't say with absolute certainty that it is a good match, but on the basis of a read-through and a couple of sessions play, the marriage is fine. The game is let down in a handful of areas. Some of these are minor gripes in presentation, but a couple that I will highlight later I find problematic. First, presentation. The good. The art is gorgeous. Very reminiscent of the best evocative art that I have seen over the years in relation to Moorcox, Elric and the like. The full-colour art introducing each section of the book captures the feel of the setting marvellously. But this is tempered by the bad, which for me is the too often used choice of flowing text over particular grayscale page art. This makes pages look pretty, but black text on a reasonably bold grey does make many parts of the book an eye strain to read. Couple this with the occasional rambling style of rules text, it not only makes sections of the book hard to read, but also hard to reference. That rambling text style is only an issue in some sections, but unfortunately these are important sections. The main culprits being combat and magic. Important keys to the rules are somewhat obscured here by in paragraphs of text, which I think would have been far better served as by greater use of bullet points, at shorter to the point paragraphs, and greater use of tabularising key points. The tables that are used are very useful, but again suffer from being presented on top of too dark grayscale art. That's all presentation stuff, which would be greatly improved by lightening the grayscale art by several shades and cutting back on its use, particularly in areas of the book that are detailing rules. Where the setting concepts are being described, the page art could, and does, invoke the feel of the game's concept. Where the book is diving into rules, it only serves to distract and make the rules harder to reference. I also have a minor gripe about the terminology pages on two counts. First, the terms described are not in alphabetical order. Second, there are large gaps in this section's pages that mean that the effective content of two pages is spread over four. This makes this whole section that is meant to be assistive far from as useful as it should have been. The main failing for me, though, is the implementation of the game's concepts within the game itself. I'll provide a few examples of elements from the first 12 pages of introduction that appear to be unconsidered or referred to in mitigation throughout the rest of the work. The first of these is one of the meta-setting. In the foreword, we are told, 
Within the Elf King RPG, we introduce the concept of the Realm Realm, a place which encompasses every aspect of existence. This being something of a meta concept. It not only includes the characters and the settings of the game, but it also includes us and our world alongside it. The reason being that there is a relation between any time spent within the setting and the time spent in our world doing so. Now, this is a high concept and one in which we, as both outsiders in our roles of players and game masters, and insiders as our interaction with the setting through our character avatars, can immerse ourselves on several different levels within this mythological landscape of immortality. However, this is uh, as far as it is explored in general. It is perhaps the expectation of the authors, and as stated within the same section of the book, that all role-playing games hold this concept, but that isn't necessarily true. Or at least, this isn't necessarily true at every role-playing game table. I would have enjoyed a deeper exploration of this, not necessarily mechanically, as I believe that would detract from it, but certainly thematically. Perhaps something of a transcendence opening, where there is some form of figurative connecting tissue between players and characters, beyond the shared immersion that is to be assumed. The second is of immortality itself. The Fae are stated as being immortal, and again it's a concept that I was excited about, especially having had experience with games involving immortal beings before, a good example of which are Tolkien's elves. The common way of treating immortality within gaming is to introduce methods of nerfing the potential such immortality brings, in order to maintain game balance. This is true of Iron Crown's MURP system, and is hand-waved by virtually all Middle-earth role-playing games since. In Elf King, there is a dichotomy at play within an elf's desire for glare, to seek fame and fortune, and ensure their star burns as brightly as it can, and focus, a descent into loss of meaning and weariness for an endless life that provides an element of inertia. Perhaps it's just me, but I found the two concepts at odds with each other. Let not either of these gripes put you off, though. The game and its premise are wonderfully evocative, and importantly for my own personal question of does this game appeal to me, reading it through, more so than playing the introductory scenario, has my mind bubbling with potential campaign setups. The setting is described in very loose detail rather than specifics, giving individual game masters and players a broad open slate onto which ins to inscribe their own tales of the Fae. In this regard, I have to admit that I am more enamoured by the setting than by the rules, but the rules do a solid job. I have thoroughly enjoyed my time with this game so far, and would say that the most immediate things that would improve things, especially for those like me, whose natural eyesight is very much below par, would be more judicial use of grayscale page art, ordering the glossary of terms, and including an index. The core book, Elf King the Role-Playing Game, is the only essential. Lucid Eye have also published a handful of supplements and adventures, all of which are inexpensive and useful. Perhaps more immediate use is Lucid Eye's YouTube channel, which comprises a number of evocative advertising shorts for the game and its supplements. It is a handy reference when considering what you, gentle reader, absorb from the written word of the game book and contrast that with the company's own vision of the game as represented but in its promotion. For me, that was an experience in and of itself. As a side note to this review, there is a miniatures battle game, Elf King Red, written in conjunction with Rick Priestley of Warhammer fame, and a collection of miniatures associated with it. Warhammer players may find some of it's familiar on the surface, but for myself, not being a fan of stats-by-the-model systems, such as Warhammer, and also presented in Elf King Red, and not having played this particular game, I'm including mention of it here for completeness. If you do have experience with it, and would like to add an addendum in the comments below, then please feel free. From my own perspective, Elf King is a conceptual game, up there with the Black Sword hack, but surpassing the latter work in artistic beauty. It delivers that concept very well, as personally evidenced by the amount of ideas it triggered in me. 
There is nothing particularly groundbreaking within the game system itself, but it is not the system that is important here. It works well enough with the settings concept. I could grow to love this game as one of personal examination, potentially horror, with the drive of the Fey being one to avoid the chains of despair such immortals face of potentially being forgotten within their own lifetimes. The drive to achieve fame, glare, enough that a living legacy could survive across the immensity of unforgiving time, would be something that I would focus on, using the threats of mortals and others as a means of achieving glory in the eyes of one's peers and stepping stones to the rank of Thane and more. If you want to experience more depth within a role-playing game than often presented, I'd recommend giving Elf King a try, Definitely focus on immersion in the setting's conceptual themes over getting bogged down by minutiae and detail. You do not need accurate mapping here, and I would suggest keeping things in mind's eye rather than putting miniatures onto the table. A thank you to Lucid Eye for providing the opportunity to review Elf King. Other than the occasional bouts of eye strain, I have thoroughly enjoyed the experience. <laughs>